I'm Ari Cohn um, at the Post Prison Education Program. And on the back side of the camera, you can't see him as Mike McCormick from KODX 96.9. And he just popped in here a little bit ago to talk about Post Prison Education Program and a disaster we're having with Facebook. Um, we're, for those who don't know, we're a 15-year-old nonprofit that started in 2005 helping men and women who come out of prison, uh, helping people who come out of prison get into college, uh, Votech University Community Colleges, with the idea being that they don't return to prison, don't die from overdose, don't die from suicide, um, and build lives worth living. And we've been very successful at that uh, over the years. So our, our uh, success rate right now, according to the University of Washington, and our student success rate is 92.13%. Our recidivism rate is 7.87%. Uh, versus the Department of Corrections just increased to 33.5. So, so since I started this, um, I've just watched the, the Department of Corrections recidivism rate just creep up, creep up, creep up, dramatically jump up, and it's never gone down. You have all these legislative hearings and meetings and strategy sessions and fake like we're doing something meetings that the governor and everybody else puts on. Um, to reduce recidivism, but it just keeps increasing. So now it's at 33 and a half percent. For the state. For the for the state for Washington State, talking about the Washington State Department of Corrections. But compared to your organization, which is at 92, 92. Our students are 92.13 percent successful. And what's what's really, um, I think people get a little confused when I start talking about data because it's not fair to talk statistics just out of the box when somebody doesn't have the background, but um, the Department of Corrections obviously has to deal with a huge variety of people. So p people with addiction issues, people with uh, high violence, uh, people who are mentally ill, People who don't have difficult lives, they, they might be in prison for a year or two and then never come back, or people who have been into prison six or seven times or ten times. Um, well, so they're, the DOC is dealing with uh, a, a mix of people uh, with from easy lives. I mean, I don't think anybody has easy lives, but in this population with circumstances where they can come out and do well and they'll never return, to people that are, have extraordinarily difficult lives um, and may not even be able to live safely on the streets. And uh, what we do, and this is what all that verbiage was about, was starting in 2010, because of a shortage of, of funding, that we decided to focus on people who the Department of Corrections uh, has designated as being high risk to recidivate and versus low or moderate. And we, we do that because not, uh, high, high violent, high nonviolent people that are high risk to recidivate make up 77% of the people who recidivate, according to Department of Corrections data. And people who are seriously mentally ill, and that's just because I think that somebody who's suffering schizoaffective disorder, borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia, uh, bipolar, they obviously are going to have a harder time, a more difficult time than somebody that doesn't have mental illness in their lives. So we focus, um, for the last nine years, we focused on people that are, again, high risk to recidivate and also suffering mental illness. And the, the most recent study of our data, we use the nonprofit version of Salesforce, shows that we're, we're doing really well on attaining that goal. So we're, I think, 70, about 74% of applicants to the program are high risk to recidivate. 
I mean, I would like that to be 100%, but, it, but, but it's 74, and so we're getting close to 100%. And about, um, I think it was 48% of that 74% uh, uh, have been determined by the Department of Corrections to, to be dealing with mental illness. So we're, when we have a, a low recidivism rate, it's remarkable because we're not dealing with people who have easy lives. We're not working for people who have easy lives. So that makes your numbers all the more impressive. Yeah, it really does. It, it does. You're taking yeah. the most challenging yeah. people. Yeah, of. yeah. There's no, there's no it just, uh, it does make our numbers impressive. And uh, it, it, what it proves absolutely, undeniably, unequivocally, irrefutably proves is that if you give people coming out of prison an opportunity, if you give them a reason to have hope and you just support them, meet their legitimate frugal needs, nothing fancy, no leather jackets, no black shiny SUVs, no, you know, we do public transportation, shared housing, um, get the fancy clothes after you graduate and have a job. Um, if, if uh, so it, it, just, it just proves that, that, that uh, people will, uh, that people can succeed. People who the public generally thinks can't succeed do succeed given minimal support, just meeting the legitimate frugal needs when they arise. You can't be two weeks late delivering on meeting their needs. If they relapse, you gotta deal with it as fast as you can. If they come out of prison into homelessness, you better get a roof over their head the day they come out. Um, if they have a psychotic breakdown, you better deal with it. Um, we have a, a horrible situation right now where uh, a psychiatrist who I think should be sued and disbarred and everything else has taken a former prisoner and put him on Suboxone and uh, Adderall and Wellbutrin and, and totally turned his life and does his kids' lives upside down and inside out. So um, when you become aware of these things, you have to deal with them. And if you do deal with them, nine times out of ten, according to the Washington University of Washington study, people will do well. Nine times out of 10, 92.13%. So where does your funding come from? Um, it used to be, and that's a huge problem with us right now, uh, from 2010, to 2015, we had Doris Buffett, Warren Buffett's sister, uh, met us through our, our work in common in the Washington State Penitentiary and and she was her foundation was funding us about 40 percent of our funding and the beautiful thing with Doris was was that if something happened if there was like great need or an inordinate number of applications and uh, or whatever something fell through uh, the Washington State Department of uh, DSHS b breached a contract with us that we had hired people to, to meet, right? Uh, whatever happened, we could like, we could reach out to them and, and get more money. We had to present the need, but we could get more money. So, and then Google. And I just, um, and they both came on board at the same time. Google is still, um, very much a part of our lives. I mean, we had a guy in here the other day that's probably the largest donor we've ever had with Google. And and he consistently, the first time he gave was 3,000, but he's, he's given 10,000, 9,000, 20,000. Um, and he mentors our students. Um, and he came in and we talked about financial need and having to turn down applicants that we'd like to be helping and, and he said well let me move up my end of the year donation and make it now and 
a week later we got a, a really, really sizable check in the mail. So Google, Google Incorporated and Google Googlers, that's what they call themselves. So we, um, plus Doris Buffett's foundation. And then a couple of years ago we applied to Norcliffe Foundation, uh, which is local here. Um, they used to be across the street when we were downtown. They, uh, we applied for a grant and they gave, they gave us the second grant we ever got. And it was a small grant and there was no site visit, even though we were right across the street. And that's grown and grown. And finally they suggested to us a couple of years ago, they were like, you should ask for more. And, and um, so I, uh, I, call, I called up about two years ago and I thought I was going to get Arlene who used to be their foundation manager but she retired and ended up on the phone with their current foundation manager and had to introduce myself and, and I said look we've been told to ask for more but I don't know how much that is so she said why don't you ask for 35 she went and got the files she came back to the phone she said why don't you apply for 35 so we applied for 35 and they granted 50 and so, so Norcliffe Foundation is, 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 is a key funder. Um, and then there's, there's probably 300 people at Google. There's a lot of individuals uh, at the Kirkland campus, at, at Fremont. Um, and, and then there's, I mean, there are individuals You know, I talked about it the other night on KODX. It was the, the people, people who get it closely involved here, and even to the extent of not just donating, uh, but, but uh, mentoring students, they either get scared to death at how bad the situations are when somebody's dealing with co-occurring co disorders, and they, and they just feel like, I can't handle this, and they pull back, right? Or they really dig in and, and get more involved, and so, a lady who fits that description, you know, Joe Jensen. Um, I mean, she she actually Joe over underwrote, underwrote or what, the whole cost of the move from the central building downtown to this office, which was hugely expensive. I mean, it was we probably spent fifty thousand dollars with this move, and um, and and we we wouldn't have made the move but for Joe. So uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of individuals and. We're trying to build it so we have more individuals and fewer foundations because that's that's what everybody says is the wise thing to do. So, so you obviously do a lot of interactions between your organization and the state of Washington um, with uh, probably Department of Corrections and perhaps other departments. Um, do you get any funding from the state or the county or the city? No. We've never, we have never, Larry Gossett tried to get money for us into the King County budget and wasn't successful. And frankly, I don't know how hard he tried, but I love Larry and, and I assume he tried hard. And, but um, uh, we've never gotten anything from the county, which is ridiculous. They have an absolutely insane, ridiculous, ineffective, um, reentry program called CCAP. It's sickeningly bad and 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 uh, and then they they know about us they've had us speak to King County Council I don't know how many times we actually did a private we did a session in private with them because they were I think they respect what we've done and and so on but no money uh, the Department of Corrections applied to the Department of Justice for a uh, a couple million dollar grant. It was a multi-year grant and they got it and we were a contractor on that so we, we got some money from the DOC but it's really federal money. And and frankly, and I'm, I'm like hesitant to say this because like Steve Sinclair was on the phone to me just two days ago fussing about a Facebook post where I, I, I reposted the Seattle Times article on my Facebook that was really slamming the governor for how many problems have, have arisen um, 
I didn't slam the Department of Corrections because I don't think they should be slammed. I mean, they've been a good partner for us for 15 years, and we couldn't have done what we do but for, for, for that partnership. But, I, but when you slam Inslee, I guess it falls back <laughs> on the head of DOC. So at the risk of uh, having Steve back on my cell phone tomorrow or whenever, it's we've we've uh, he, he he loves to say, you know, we're not a funder. But then they'll turn around and fund. I mean, they are a funder. They can they can choose how to spend their 1.8 billion dollar biennial budget, and they choose to prioritize the wrong things, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and recidivism keeps raising and raising and rising and increasing. So. We've never gotten DOC, State of Washington, money from the Department of Corrections. We have gotten some fairly significant money, but it was federal money under that Second Chance grant. Are there some laws or hurdles for you getting money from the state? Because, again, just from looking at it from the State of Washington and fiscal responsibility, it would seem to be a really good investment on a state's part to invest in an organization like yours that has a really good recidivism rate and puts people into, you know, back out into society as, as uh, functioning, um, valuable um, members uh, that, you know, who I've met numerous people who've gone through your program who I would feel um, glad to have them living next door to me, you know? Um, what are we missing here as to why the state is not funding either your organization or an organization like yours um, doing your work? Uh, so first of all, it goes back to the legislature. It, it doesn't go back to the DOC. It really doesn't. And I'm not like, can I say kissing ass? All right, I'm not like kissing the DOC's ass with this. It's, it's the governor's fault, it's the legislator's fault. If you take people like Roger Goodman in the House of Representatives, who's chair of the Public Safety Committee, he doesn't really care. He could come over here, he was on my original board of directors, he can come over here and say he cares, but his actions prove that he doesn't. Jeannie Darnell is the worst, um, and she's in basically Roger's position, but in the Senate. and. So they, what they do is they fake like they care. They have hearings, they have meetings, they say things, they send out mailers. The governor has this ridiculous recidivism committee, I forget, reentry committee, I forget it, what it is. Um, and it's, and, but as far as really doing something, I think if you go back to Brave New Films, did a really short five minute documentary on, called Power of Fear. And just watch it, just Google Brave New Films, Power of Fear. And it, go, it starts, I think, with Richard Nixon in the, in the early 70s, tough on crime, soft on crime. And I think maybe realistically uh, um, or justifiably, I think a lot of legislators believe if they vote to help former prisoners and prisoners, they'll be voted out of office. And, 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 and so they won't. Um, my, uh, I've got a thousand anecdotes for that. The one that I think is the best um, probably don't have time to tell, but the, the second best is, you hear me I continually talking about Eldon Vale. And, and he'll be on my phone fussing at me like, you know, I'm retired, get my name out of this. So Eldon's a former, he, he's a career guy at the DOC. He, uh, when I met him, he was deputy secretary in charge of the prisons division. Um, and then he became secretary. Um, and then he retired. And um, when he was on the governor's cabinet, this would have been Gregoire's cabinet, um, we uh, um, that was when Doris Buffett's foundation first reached out to us. It was like 2010, 
And it was pretty amazing to, to you know, Doris Buffett uh, and her brother Warren had just been in the, with Harry Belafonte, they had just been in the New York Times together at a graduation in a notorious prison in New York State, which was pretty extraordinary. So they're in the New York Times. And it's the Buffets, right? And so you don't expect, I mean, I don't expect, you know, there's a, I could give you a long list of people I don't expect to call me on my phone. And, 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 and I didn't expect, you know, to get an email from, from Doris Buffett's director saying that they had been instructed by Doris to reach out to us. And so, so what happened was uh, Betty Beal, who, if, if we could fit something in really negative about Mitty Bill and, and the Sunshine Lady as its foundation as it stands now, absent Doris's involvement, I want to try to do that because it's super important. But Mitty wrote, and and she said, and I still have the email. She said, uh, um, "We're interested in in funding your program." And they asked six really difficult questions. And you know, back then that conference table w was up, we were up at the central building. And here in this big room, it looks like it's a small, it looks like a small conference table up at our old office. It was, it looked pretty big, right? And, and, uh, and by the time we finished answering the questions, we had like 23 spreadsheets. Like they wanted to know, they wanted to know what kind of scholarships we we gave, and we didn't know the answer. It was it was in our data. It turned out we had 23 different kinds of scholarships, right? And then they wanted to know how much money for housing, how much for tuition, how much for books, how much for bus passes, and then and right and, and so it took us way over a month to put all that together. We shipped it off to Philadelphia, and nothing happened for a month. And I we thought, okay, like. Okay, it's dead. It's not going anywhere. And then we got an email from Mitty Beal saying, um, saying uh, it's pretty clear you don't have sustained funding, right? And in our office, and I almost I'm gonna, I'm going to say it anyway, but I'm going to apologize for being crude. But in our office, we were like, "No shit, Charlie Brown. Tell us something we don't know, right?" Because we're always scraping for dollars. We are always scraping for dollars. Seven hundred people are releasing from Washington's prisons every month, and and maybe half of them are mentally ill. Uh, so. Um, and, and she was asking us to address the issue because they, did, they didn't want to put money into a program that, didn't, that might not survive, you know. And so I needed to answer her honestly, but I needed a positive spin on it. And I talked to people all over the United States that I knew, right, and, and getting advice on how to, to uh, respond. And so on a Sunday, I sat in, uh, and it's Sunday now, isn't it? And I, I sat in, uh, I finally got my answer ready, and I typed it out, which I still have. And what I said to Mitty was basically, you know, you're right, we don't have sustained funding, and that's for the exact same reason there would be no post-secondary education being taught in the Coyote Ridge Correction Center or the Washington State Penitentiary, but for you paying for it. If you weren't paying 290000 a year to Walla Walla Community College, there would be no education being taught in Walla Walla, Washington State Penitentiary, or in Connell, Coyote Ridge Correction Center. And that's due to legislative cowardice and political expediency. Um, and, and I thought, you know, I wonder if Eldon Vale will disavow this. So I cut and pasted the paragraph, and, and I sent it to Eldon. And I didn't send it to his personal email. I sent it to his DOC email. And he normally would answer me, like, really quickly. I mean, almost, I mean, within the hour. No matter how busy, no matter how bad the economy was, no matter what the problems were, he would he normally answer me really quickly. Three days went by, and I decided he wasn't going to answer me at all. And then he wrote back, because what I asked him was, I gave him the paragraph that we were going to send to the Sunshine Lady, and I said, is this a fair statement, that we don't have post-secondary education in the prisons 
or, or being paid for after release due to legislative cowardice. Is that a fair statement? And Eldon wrote back a, like four words, simple answer, yes, that's a fair statement. So you had the guy, secretary of the second largest state agency, Department of Corrections, sit a member of the governor's cabinet saying we, we don't, there's no funding for post-secondary education for prisoners and former prisoners due to legislative cowardice. And that's the truth. That's the truth. Uh, these people care about their little piddly ass paychecks uh, and, and being able to go down to Olympia and r run around in the marble palaces for three months a year way, and not being voted out of office way more than they care about solving problems. So what they do, you know, they, they, uh, they address politically safe issues and they will not address or deal with issues that aren't politically safe. So there you go. And again, Google, if you want, it's really powerful. I, I, I'm a political science major, and, um, and so I, know, I, I feel like I know these issues. And, but when I watched Robert Greenwald's Brave New Films with this short documentary, Power of Fear, it was like, you've got Ronald Reagan and, and Bill Clinton. For people who, by, for all my liberal friends, and I'm way more liberal than anybody you know, I think Che Guevara is a conservative Republican compared to my politics. But, it, for, for everybody who wants to think that everything Democrats do nothing wrong, that everything Democrats do is right, or that everything Republicans do is wrong, they're bonkers. And so in this short documentary from Brave New Films, you've got Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and George Bush uh, all the way back to Nixon. And it doesn't matter whether they're Republican or, or Democrat, the damage that they've done that's not reversible. I mean, Joe Biden is getting slammed with it right now, and I'm loving it. You know, his support of the death penalty, uh, but his support of the of, of the legislation at Congress that created this massive incarceration that we have. That was Joe Biden, and, and it played a huge part in that. But it goes all the way back. They're all um, they've built this fear of prisoners and former prisoners, and and it's not fact based. It's just people spewing how, out hate and anger and whatever they think they can spew out that will get them votes and get them elected. So that's a really good, for short doc, it's really cool, five minutes. And it's just work, Google it and watch it. It's, that's the whole answer to your question. And what's the name of it again? It's just Power of Fear. So just go, all you got to do is Google Brave New Films, Power of Fear, and you'll come up with this short documentary. I mean, what they did was Greenwald, who is president and founder of Brave New Films, he, uh, when he came to us two Januarys ago and wanted us to partner on a film about addiction, his idea was to have a five-part documentary with a bunch of short documentaries that when all put together would be a, a longer documentary. And so the first, the introductory sh short doc was Power of Fear. And then, and then the second part uh, was a 17-minute segment. They actually had film crews up here, and and uh, and and it, it it was on addiction, and it, it was our work and two of our students. So, talk about your current financial issue that stems from an event you were planning on doing back in June. Right. Really? Tell us how the, what that was, how that came about, where it is right now. Well, you know, usually what we've, we've leased or rented town hall in 15 years only three times. So if I identify, if there's an issue that I think is so important that I'm willing to contract with Town Hall, which is not inexpensive. Um, it, it's, that's a fabulous place. I think it's, a, it's sort of the heart of the city. Benaroya Hall, Seattle Symphony, Town Hall, those are all like heart of the city places, but it's expensive, right? And, uh, so, but it, it, it has to be, for me to do that and spend money on a Town Hall event, it, ha it has to be an important issue. And mental illness is, is, is the, the absolute most critical issue uh, in the state of Washington, as far as I'm concerned. I don't, I don't, 
I don't care what Bill Gates says. I don't care what Melinda says. I don't give a damn what Dow Constantine says. And I sure don't care what Inslee says. Bar none, there's, we've criminalized mental illness and huge numbers of people are caught up in it. And that's all supported by data. Uh, and nobody's doing anything about it. So, you know, what, what people have taught me over the last 15, 20 years is for the most part, people don't do good things for the right reason. If you're talking about the legislature, that's the fact, and the governor. Um, people don't do the right thing for the right reason. You gotta, you've got to embarrass them, put them on a movie screen, or put them on the front page of the Tacoma News Tribune, you, you, and then you can embarrass them into uh, doing what needs to be done. And uh, I mean, just a short anecdote. The first time we proved that to be true was the Department of Corrections had shipped against their own policies. That's, that blows my mind. They had a policy to not ship prisoners who were parents to out-of-state for-profit prisons. It was a DOC policy, and they had violated it to the point they had 1,200 men in Arizona and Oklahoma and Minnesota. Um, and this was maybe 2007 or so. And you couldn't get them to stop shipping parents out of state um, where their kids could never see them again because these are, for, these are poor families, right? And so we did, uh, cripes, we, I probably spent $10,000. If I spent a penny, I spent $10,000 in a multi month period meeting with legislators, having lunches, getting expert witnesses, um, bringing people like Ben DeHaan, uh, for, uh, uh, up to, to meet with legislators. Ben was secretary of the DOC in Oregon and, uh, and he's now at the University of Washington and, and started the Children's Alliance in, in Portland uh, and then and left there and came to Casey Family Foundation and getting people like Ben to meet with legislators and, and just re re reviewing the facts, and it didn't go anywhere. I, I, instead of buying lunch for Debbie Regala and 10 legislators at a fancy restaurant in Tacoma, I should have just thrown the money in the toilet and stayed in Seattle and not spent the gas. I mean, so f finally, I went to Roger Goodman and Mary Helen Roberts, and they were both on Mary Lou Dickerson's committee in the House of Representatives and that oversaw the Department of Corrections. And we got, I think, I don't know if Roger wrote the, but we got Democratic caucus staff to write the bill. And, and the bill, and then we got Mary Helen and Roger to, to support the bill, to prime the bill. And then we got Mary Lou to hear it, right? And, um, and what the bill did was it outlawed the DOC basically violating their, their law, right? But, and so on the day that Mary Lou Dickerson set that for hearing, I walked in with a reporter from the News Tribune and TV cameras. So we had print media and we had TV cameras there and we bust people down there. And the hearing room was standing room only. And we got, Mary Lou Dickerson allowed a 12 year old boy whose dad was in prison in Arizona to testify. Um, and people were crying. And Joe Turner, who's dead now, but was amazing, uh, put it on the front page of the News Tribune, uh, and, and so we got we we brought this bill right, and and uh, and DOC came over. At Re Ruben Cedeno was deputy secretary of of the prisons division. I think Eldon was. I know Eldon was secretary then, and a whole army of DOC people, and and they came over in opposition to the bill, and. Uh, but it was five of them against 70 of us in the hearing room, plus media, plus 30 or 50 out in the hallways in JLOB. And it got so emotional that when this 12-year-old kid was testifying, he started crying, he couldn't finish his testimony, so his mom asked to finish it. Um, and then, then people like Mary, Mary Helen Roberts were crying. Members of the legislature were crying. Mary Helen got up and went back in the coffee room to get the tears out off of her face. And, 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 after, and 
the audience was clapping. That's not appropriate. You can't clap at a hearing. Don't do it. It's, it, it, it but Mary Lou wouldn't call him down. She very sheepishly um, was like, now, now, please don't do that. It was wonderful. But, you know, so that night, Roger Goodman and I, oh, I'll tell you a funny story. So, uh, I was leaving and I'm walking out with press, right? And I'm going down this wide hall, hallway in this marble palace, John L. O'Brien building. And, and I'm walking out with some parents and Ruben Cedeno is chasing me down. This is verbatim, right? I love this story. And, he, and, 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 and I didn't hear him, and he, he, but he's wanting to talk. And he? he was the deputy secretary of the prisons division at the Department of Corrections at that time. And he was there basically on Eldon's behalf. Eldon stayed over at headquarters. And, uh, and, he, and he's literally come down the hallway, totally humiliating himself in the department. He's like, Ari, Ari, wait, wait, you know. And people were like, Ruben's chasing you down. So we stopped and he came up to me and I'm, again I'm surrounded by parents and I've got media including Joe Turner and he, and he, and he said verbatim, he said, he said, Ari, please call off the dogs. I mean he was, really, he was like, please call off the dogs. And I'm like, and I liked Ruben and I'm like, I'm like, Ruben, this is the deal. I'm not going to call off the dogs and when you go back to DOC headquarters for your CIA briefing with Eldon in the big conference room, tell him I'm just getting started. Tell him I'm just getting started. I won't call off the dogs. That night, Roger Goodman and I both got an email from Ellen Vale saying that the out-of-state transfers would stop. And within a couple months, they brought 1,200 men back from out-of-state for profit prisons back here. That, that may have been um, the crowning achievement that this program's ever done. Because uh, probably 82% of those men had on average 1.91 kids. And so, but that, that's how, if you're gonna, you could piddle around like Jennifer Shaw when she was at ACLU here in town. She spent 10 or 11 years trying to get legislation through to remedy a bad situation with LFOs, legal financial obligations. And she finally got about a third of what she wanted. And that taught me a huge lesson. You know, people are dying, I'm not gonna wait 10 years. Plus, I'm 700 years old, and I'm not going to be around here in 10 years. I hope. So, um, it just that whole process was a, a big lesson, and 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 I just uh, and so 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 going back to town hall, mental illness was had risen to the level where I cared enough about it, uh, and I, if we have time or you want, I can talk about that. Uh, uh, it's it's horrible. We could even put a laptop out here and, and sh show you what people look like in DOC data and uh, but so I, I, I released Town Hall and then I uh, and I reached out to Pete Early who I didn't know at all at the time and uh, he wrote this amazing book he's a former Washington Post reporter um, and his uh, his son and he's written I think 17 books he's a Pulitzer Prize nominee um, but this book crazy um, it's um, it's a, uh, uh, a father's search through America's mental health madness. And he wrote this book because his son got caught up in the criminal justice system and died. And that's when Pete left the Washington Post and, and, and went to work making mental illness be an issue that people couldn't ignore. So we, I reached out to Pete. He agreed to keynote at Town Hall. And then we contracted Town Hall. And then the day, once we had the contract signed with Town Hall and Pete's agreement, then I put, uh, we put, created an event on Facebook. And, um, you know, we've brought in hundreds of thousands of dollars promoting like Seattle Foundation Give Big, which was around annually for a number of years, uh, by using Facebook to promote fundraisers or events um, and and w so in uh, we spent fifty thousand dollars with Facebook real number fifty thousand more a little bit more over 15 years with Facebook it sounds ludicrous except for that our p l probably shows about 3.3 .3 million dollars that has come into this nonprofit over 
the last 15 years, and a lot of that is thanks to Facebook, um, unfortunately. I mean, we've got a listserv, we do public events, you know, blah, 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 but, but we, we rely on Facebook. And they very quickly, much to my surprise, uh, didn't approve the promotion. I mean, they declined the promotion, they turned it down, and so you get a notification that, that it's uh, not been approved. Like within a day? Or? Yeah, it was within a day, and, and I was shocked because, uh, you know, so somebody can email this clip to Zuckerberg and tell him I said to kiss my ass. Him and, you know, I don't, ex I don't, I don't see why it's reasonable to turn down a town hall discussion about serious mental illness when maybe half of our prisoners are, are, involved, are caught up in serious mental illness. And I can give you the DOC date on that. Um, so I was shocked when they did it. And I, they make it be, you know, you and I were discussing it earlier, one of the things, I, 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 there's a lot of things I love about Google in addition to their money and the people who work there. Uh, and one of them is you can get a real person on the phone. If you have a problem, you can actually, if you, like if you have a Google phone, you can get a real person on the phone. They'll actually dial into your phone and fix your problems. Facebook is the exact opposite. They are killing themselves to hide behind links and, 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 and I couldn't find how to appeal their decision. And it took me more than a few days. And then I sent a communication just basically saying like, it was pretty much like, what the hell are you doing? You know, how can you, how can you, how can you justify refusing a promotion to have a discussion uh, uh, about mental illness at a town hall in downtown Seattle? And I mean, like, what's wrong with that? And I didn't even get an answer from those people. And and uh, um, and then and then we sort of got, you know, you get, you you can't promote, you can't fill town hall up, it now seats 800 by, you know, but you can't get six to 800 people in town hall with a promotion that starts a month before the event. It's not happened. We've done it too many times in movie theaters and we've just done too many events. And, and you need at least six weeks. And that's really cutting it short. So the closer we got to the day of the event, the more worried I was. So finally I found a link um, and they're hard to find. Tr try to appeal some of these people. It's, it's difficult. Um, and, and I found a link and appealed it. Um, but by then I think, you know, s several months have gone by and we're having board meetings about what, should we reschedule this? And like, is Pete Early gonna shoot us, at, uh, you know, or be, you know, will, will, will he be able to reschedule? Will, will he be willing to reschedule? You know, what's town hall schedule look like? Can we, can they? And, uh, but anyway, we finally, we, we got um, two months away from the event, you know, I mean, two months down the road. And, and, uh, and I found this link and I appealed again. And, uh, and that appeal, and then at the same time, I also got, it was like two processes with, with Facebook. So I got, I found uh, a, a separate from the appeal that I did, I found another link um, that was like, we'll send you, you know, log on here and answer these questions and provide this information, right? I talked about this on Cairo the other day, on Dave Ross's show, and, and, uh, um, and, uh, and if you pass this multiple choice test or something, um, then we can move to clearing you. And, and, and then, and what it, turned, what it turned out to be, and I'll, then I'll talk about the two things that happened, but what it turned out to be is Facebook doesn't, is, doesn't want to get caught up in another Donald Trump 2016 election and they're not going to so they're going to make sure and that's good I mean I hope I don't know anybody that you know that wants to see Donald Trump elected or re-elected or whatever but 
or 2016 happen again. And, and, and so Facebook is working really hard to, to uh, have their platform not be misused with, with false posts and, and media. And that did emanate from Russia, it's just a fact. And, and, and uh, so you have to prove you're not a Russian. That's just really what it is. You have to prove you're not a Cambridge Analytica type person. You're not, you don't live in St. Petersburg, Russia. You're not working for Putin. You're not trying to influence local, state, national elections. And, and, and so the two-part process was, was I, I filed the complaint uh, again and, and didn't have to do anything more with that. And then I found this other link that 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 when I activated that, then they got back to me, and it was and they gave me a link to click on, and they ran me through a multiple choice questions, but it was more than that. I mean, you had to make I had to make a zero you had to upload a scanned copy of my driver's license front and back, and they wanted super high resolution. There was like three of us sat over there trying to get it to meet their, what they required, right? And we finally had to call an IT guy, and then with Adobe software, they got it right. So you had to upload my driver's license, which worries me. Upload your driver's license to Facebook is not something I'm comfortable with, right? Uh, but we, we did. And, and then there were multiple choice questions, and, and like 30, maybe 50 years ago, literally, so I was in 1982, 40 years ago, I lived on Pinecroft Drive outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And one of the multiple choice questions was, what was the street number? And it gave five choices. And, and so if I didn't, if the 105 hadn't rung a bell, I'd have been sunk. But just fortunately, it rang a bell. So I, I got all those right. And then you and, and and we up and they accepted the scanned copy of the driver's license and then they uh, uh, and then you get a notice saying okay you answer this is it's all good we're mailing a letter to your house right and when you get it there'll be a six-digit code in it log back in put in the code and then you'll be cleared to advertise and so then so like I'm I'm. I live six, seven miles north of town, and this office is three miles south of town in Soto. And every day I'm like frantically going home, hoping like hell the this letter right here is in the mail. And it kept not being in the mail. I thought that they had a, a computer generated, and it probably would generate the same day they told me it was coming. And it took a long time for the letter to come. Um, and I mean, this is, by the way, I don't know if you can see it, but this is this is this is the the letter, uh, and there are the codes, right? And so, um, and but then in the middle of it, the the other the second appeal that I put in worked, and so we got uh, we got this. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's this is a a, a snippet or a cup of, cut and paste from a, a Facebook notification you appealed your de our decision on your ads or productions and then it goes on to say we've reviewed your ad again and basically determined I know I can't use the F word on this right okay. I can't so it's, ba it's basically the message was basically oops we fucked up there's no other when you walked in here a little bit ago I was googling for what's the correct what's an appropriate abbreviation for fucked up yeah, or F apostrophe D, okay. and 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 but what they did was so they they put this program in jeopardy. They put this 15-year-old nonprofit in jeopardy of going under, and for damn sure have caused us to turn our backs on more applicants than you can count by making a bad decision. And 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 so but so they came back and admitted that the original decision was wrong. And I mean, we've reviewed your ad again and have determined that it does not relate to politics and does not need to include your disclaimer, right? So, so somebody in the Philippines or India or some, or some, somebody that, that Facebook can pay very little money to, too little money to, uh, versus 
uh, somebody who's higher, a higher level of education made a bad decision, or an algorithm made a bad decision, uh, or a combination of both. And, and so, and it, and, you know, so, so uh, at that point we're 17 days from the event, and we had a board meeting. We knew we couldn't fill town hall promoting for 17 days. That, it was a no-brainer board decision. And so we, we called Pete early and got him to agree to October 9th. And we canceled, uh, we, and, we, and the town hall was amazing. They didn't, even they didn't keep our deposit. They, let, they moved the deposit forward and let it go with October 9th. Um, but 17 days from the event, we had no choice but to put it off. And that event would have generated more than $30,000. And that's cash flow that I was counting on. I mean, we've done so many events like rent the largest theater at AMC Pacific Place 11 and show a documentary um, or, or rent, you know, rent town hall and, and sell tickets and have, and have a foundation match donations, maybe a foundation, Lucky Seven Foundation, when we did a, we showed Lemon at AMC Pacific Place. Um, Pioneer Human Services was a $2,500 sponsor. Lucky Seven Foundation kicked in uh, uh, a $10,000 match, so that gives you 20. It's, it would, we would have had easily $30,000 income from that that we needed. We had, you know, to not say no to applicants who might literally die. And we should talk about Mark Stern's data a minute uh, because people, if you listen to the Jeannie Darnielles and the Roger Goodmans and the Sonia Hallams and the, and the Jay Inslees, they, have, they would have you believe in the, that the DOC is doing a wonderful job under their watch and that everything's hunky-dory, as my mother would say, right? And that's just a lie. It's an it's absolute lie. Um, so we should talk about Mark's morbidity studies, but, but we needed that money. And we've been saying no to people who we would otherwise say yes to. And I had it budgeted. I mean, we, we're always within, uh, I mean, uh, I can't say that. We're, uh, we're, we're always super very close to um, to be in zero balance on everything. I mean, if somebody comes out of prison and they need a roof over their head, it's not likely that they're going to walk in here and get a no unless there's a good reason, right? If somebody's hungry, it's not likely that they're going to come in here and say no. If somebody is a parent and has high needs and they're mentally ill, you can bet your whatever I'll overdraft our accounts to help that person. So we're always close to the wire. And you know, some people criticize for me, me for that, and they can go to hell. You know, they can go to hell. Come in here and read these applications. I mean, we'll, I'll put you in a room where there's 700 of them right over there. Read these applications, meet these people, and then tell me how you can say no. You, you, we can't. And I don't want to be around people that can. So, so generally, in the presence of great need, we say yes even when we're close to the bone. And, and, and so if, if, I'm, if I've got something like t a town hall, I've, I've got that 30,000 plus factored. I'm not, I'm not guessing it might go 40 if we're lucky, but I know it's gonna go 30 based on past experience. And, and Facebook killed that. And, and, and now we're in such bad shape over that, we can't meet obligations that our students are at risk, and the nonprofit overall is at risk. And that's just because of this insanity with these, with these people making bad decisions. Not doing what they did. Again, I, I like, it's a smart thing to make sure that people aren't advertising on Facebook who are not who they pretend to be, or who they say they are. But they're using bad algorithms, they're using uneducated people, they're doing both of those things. But this bad process that they've done, very, I mean, we're really, uh, we're close. We're, we're in great jeopardy. There's no other way to put it. And we are saying no to people that we, I mean, yes to people that, or we're saying no to people that we, that we never would have said no to in the, in the past. You know, if somebody's motivated and they've been to prison six or seven times and they've got kids and our scholarship committee thinks they're deserving of help, 
um, then we're really like we're, we we really want to say yes, and we'll 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 go we'll pay creditors late, we'll do whatever the hell it takes, you know, to be able to say yes. But right now, we're just on the cusp of 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 a, a disaster um, caused by Facebook, and there's no other way to put it. And you know, and maybe now is a good time to talk to talk about Mark Stern's study. So uh, because this, I mean, this is how bad it is. It's it's. Uh, I don't. You've heard this anecdote before, but and I'll try to not TMI it. But it was it was very real to me. Uh, uh, and nine years later, I remember it like yesterday. D DOC contacted us. A guy had been in prison nine times, and uh, and uh, his diagnosis is schizoaffective disorder. And uh, and the lady who worked for DOC was um, at the special offender unit up at Monroe. She was really clear. She was like, if you don't get involved, he has no chance. He came from a Native American community in Clark County, abject poverty. I talked to his mother once. She didn't, she didn't have the education to understand, to begin to understand what schizoaffective disorder was. And if she did understand it, she didn't have the financial ability to help help her son. And and so and DOC, so DOC was like, if you don't get involved, he has no chance. And um, we started seeing more and more of that. And, and we continue to see more and more of it. And But what, what happened is, it was sort of like an avalanche, and and I don't know how we didn't get hit with avalanche the first five years of our history, 2005 to 2010. But starting in 2010, we were sort of like getting washed away by it, like the Johnstown flood or something. And, and for, most people aren't old enough to know what that is, but Google Johnstown flood. It was horrible. Lots of people died, and so. Um, at some point, Cheryl Strange, who's now secretary of DSHS, Cheryl was deputy secretary of the Department of Corrections under Eldon Vale. And we were seeing so much of this, I wrote her an email, and I knew her really well. I, I mean, uh, know her really well. And, and, I, and I was just like, so if the FCC's not involved with this, I can say fuck? Is that right? All right. So. I'm like, um, I was like, just how fucking many are there? You know, of the 700 men and women that release from DOC's prisons every month, how many are suffering mental illness? And she gave me a really bad answer, a really bad answer. She guessed that it was 100 of the 700, right? And. And she said at least, but that was a really bad answer for somebody whose background is mental health. I mean, she just recently was CEO of, of Western States Hospital and now is head of DSHS. And, um, and, um, and the flood of applicants in that situation continued to increase. So I was up at Monroe, Scott Frakes, who's now head of DOC in Nebraska, was there, and I was speaking at a graduation event, right, in WSR, in the Washington State Reformatory. And I was frustrated, and I saw, I saw Scott, and I asked him, um, you know, Cheryl Strange said, and I, I think she was wrong, it's way more than that, what do you think? So he said, and this is the guy who's over SOU, right, at the time, he, he guessed that it was no less than 145 or 146. Big, big increase from 100. And uh, and that even turned out to be wrong. Uh, I mean, recent data uh, has it. Uh, there's a 15-year data set from the Department of Corrections that shows 34 percent of Washington's prisoners suffer serious mental illness. But the the flaw with that data set is, uh, and anybody that wants this. 
can email me and I'll send it to them. I'm, uh, but this is a data set showing ESCO classifications of prisoners over, over a 15 year period. And S code is the designator for mental illness or not. So S code zero is you go through the DOC male and female intake and you don't get classified, which should be impossible. That should be impossible that somebody go through male and female intake and not have their mental health determined one way or the other. And then S code one, you can basically take that as healthy, mentally healthy, not mental ill, not mentally, not suffering mental illness. S code two, three, four, five, and the higher the number, you've got mental illness, serious mental illness, um, and the higher the number, the worse it is. Um, and so this data set from DOC, if, if you take all the S code 2345, that's 34% of the prisoners in this 15 year period. But over here in S code one column, they had 22,000 men and women, I'm gonna say it again, 22,000 men and women went through male and female take, intake at Purdy, it's Gig Harbor or Shelton, and did not get classified. So you have to know that if those 22,000 have been classified, some percentage would have been S code 2345. So maybe the 34% is 40%, maybe it's 45%. I've had a lot of people at DOC say that they believe it's half or more. Recently, I asked uh, DOC for more specific information and we got data f within the last two years. I put it on my Facebook the other day. If you, if my privacy settings are wide open on my personal Facebook page, so if you go to, R let's just search R.A. Cohn and uh, then scroll down and, and you'll see a, a Department of Corrections spreadsheet, right? And that data set is 39%. So, so I mean, this is, so what, what? What we're not providing care or treatment for people suffering mental illness who come from poor families, um, and so they end up in prison. It's just that, that simple, and and um, and that kind of leads into to to the what happens to him afterwards scenario, which Mark Stern, who's an MD, former Assistant Secretary of the Health Division of the Department of Corrections, and Ingrid Bingswanger, who I may, may pronounce her, mispronounce her name, but she's also an MD, she's in Colorado now. They did a 2007 study and updated it in 2013, and that morbidity study shows that things are so bad, reentry is so bad that that with, within less than two years, uh, 70 of, of the release, 70 men and women in Washington State are dying from overdose or suicide. So, uh, and, and this is a small state, so to have 70 people dying every year, every year, within less than two years of their release, that's horrible. And nationally, it's 5,000. It's 5,000, so, so it, there can't be a better example in my mind other than knowing one of the people who die uh, uh, that, than, than Mark and Ingrid's data. And, and it's just showing that reentry is so bad that people are, are dying in and, and, and significant numbers every year within less than two years. They don't even make it to two years after release. It's 1.9 years. And then, you know, the, the other thing is there's DOC data. You can edit as much of this out as you want. So I'm like TMI on it to death, but, but like you can cut out all segments. But uh, um, there's a funny story here. I, I despise, there's two secretaries at DOC that I've known since I've been involved with this who I absolutely despise. Bernie Warner, I despise. Um, and Harold Clark was worse. Uh, so um, the uh, we had um, uh, she's retired now, but Bernie Warner's policy director, uh, her last name is Mullins. She's on my Facebook, and I can't—I know her really well. Sandy Mullins. Um, asked me to speak 
to D DSC headquarters at a meeting of a bunch of executives. It was at a Saturday meeting at headquarters for Correctional Industries. And um, a month or so before that, I had taken the DSC's fact card, they publish it quarterly, and I handed it out at a, at a hearing at the legislature that was f in favor of post-secondary education, and Bernie Warner was at the hearing. And it showed, it showed a dramatic increase in readmission, which is uh, like recidivism but not time barred. And it showed readmission rate was 48%. So what that meant, and I handed out color copies. Everybody in that hearing room, it was Roger Goodman's committee, everybody in that hearing room got a color copy of this fact card. And the legislators on his public safety committee got a copy. And, uh, and, and Bernie saw all that, right? And, and, uh, and, and really, you know, I handed it out because there's no excuse. It's not justifiable um, to have almost 50% of the people who were released from prison return to prison. That's not justifiable. I mean, it's, it's just not, and it's wrong. And especially when there, it doesn't have to be. Um, and for the people who care about kids and don't care about adults and adult, their parents, most of these people are, have kids and families are being destroyed. So for all the people at Rakes Foundation and Gates Foundation who want to go the politically safe route and let's just help kids, but oh heavens no, let's not even think about their adult parents, uh, kiss my ass. Really. Uh, so, um, anyway, so then Sandy asked me to come down and talk to this group on a Saturday, and I'm going to print out the latest version of the fact card and take it to this meeting, right? And DOC had taken it off their website. They had taken the, 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 the quarterly report that showed readmission, they had taken it off of their website. So we got down to this meeting, and I'm at the head of the table, and Sandy's right over here. And I asked her in front of 40 people, I'm like, did, I, I'm like, Ber I, Bernie Warner had you take this off because I slammed him at the legislature the other day about 48%. And in front of everybody, she admitted it. So readmission had gotten so high that, that, that uh, Bernie took it down. And, and the history of when they were using readmission is that in 2011, it was uh, like 42% and then it rose very quickly to 48%. So these are people releasing from the DOC into nothingness, basically, um, not prepared by the Department of Corrections to do well. Probably you could say that's because the legislature doesn't give the DOC the money to do it, uh, but it's more complicated than that. Um, and. Uh, and so 48% within a few years, the 42 rose up to 48. And, and by the end of 2012, so like in about a year, year and a half, um, it started crossing 50%. And it consistently since then has been 50%, 53%. So now you can say with a straight face, more than, more than half of the people who, wa who released from Washington's prisons return to prison with one or more new felony convictions. And Steve Sinclair can talk to me all he wants and say we're not a funder uh, and, and our job is community safety, but where's the community safety if you've got more than half the people coming out of prison uh, going back? Because when, when you go back, that means you committed a crime in the community, one or more. I mean, maybe you didn't commit, most people, I don't think a lot of people commit one felony crime at a time. You'll see people look, facing five charges at a time, three charges. So an event happens, maybe it involves multiple laws, and so you have multiple felonies. But um, So that's, if you take Mark Stern's morbidity data, and, show, and then you take the DOC's readmission data, and they're climbing, they're climbing recidivism rate, um, that that's 
That's first of all, that's why we get so many applications. That's why we get so many phone calls from prisoners. That's why prisoners are so darn desperate as they approach release. They're scared. People who will, who would get in a fight, you know, with with Goliath, and not be scared, uh, are freaked out, scared, panicked uh, over, over 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 the fear of release because they've been back before, they know they'll be back again, they've seen their friends come out and release and die, or, or, or whatever. It's, it's, so, um, that's, you know, that's a big issue. And, 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 and that's what makes it be really hard for us. We, we uh, there's a file over in Shalisha's office that I could actually show you. So when McKenna and Marla were here, during the spring quarter and turning from Seattle Academy, we went through another kind of excruciating uh, period of, of reevaluating and turning down applications without even meeting with people, not even giving them the benefit of a scholarship committee meeting, just because we're underfunded. And um, um, in the process of that, I asked them to to at every I asked them to look at every to see if if people had returned to prison. You know, so of the people that applied, when we didn't respond, when we didn't say yes, when we didn't get involved in their lives, how many returned to prison? And there's a file over there that's this thick. You know, and, and so when we say no, pe people are dying, they're overdosing, they're dying from suicide, and they're returning to prison, and. It, it, and we think they're worthy people. And, and like you said earlier, you know, we've come to know them. We're not fancy pants Jeannie Darnell sitting in her goddamn fancy pants office in JLOB or where or the ledge office, uh, having done her level best to not meet prisoners, to stay away, to, to not get involved in the, in the issues that that these men and women people face. And and. Uh, uh, so we get to know people personally, and we 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 come to trust them, and they come to trust us, and more than nine times out of ten they're successful. So so it, it really hurts. It's 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 devastating. I guarantee you, there's no entity on earth that has a higher turnover rate of employees than we do, and it's because people collapse here. It's you, you can you can stand so much sadness and then you quit. So. Um, um, so, so, so that's it. It's, it's, it's really bad, and, and it's horribly bad. And the only, the only way for me to describe it better, it would be if you were, um, for example, a Googler who life coached one of these students and knew them well, and got to know them well, and got to care about them, and then see them return to prison, um, or worse. Or, or see them succeed, and, and just set the world on fire. So, um, a few people do, will do that. So, and, I, and, and I'm just gonna, you know, I'm really, uh, I've been really angry at, at, at with Sunshine Lady Foundation as it exists today, managed by Mitty Bill and not, with Doris Buffett not involved any longer. Uh, in 2015, she became cognitively impaired. Warren moved her to Boston into some facilitated living uh, building that he owns, one of his companies owns. And uh, now she's full-blown dementia. Uh, Sasha Pfeiffer, who used to be with Boston Globe and did that amazing movie, the, the movie Spotlight, that was that was about Sasha and, the, and other members of the of the uh, Spotlight team at the Boston Globe, and so Sasha uh, has interviewed her since. And but now Sasha's left Boston Globe and gone with NPR, and I think Washington D.C. But Sasha sent me a link the other day, a couple months ago, uh, and it was a picture of Doris outside a new small foundation she set up in Boston with her grandson pushing the wheelchair and you could tell that she's just it's sort of a hunk of flesh like her mind's not there it's just a body in a wheelchair and so now she's entered full-blown dementia so 
when she when she's like if she's at her home in Rockport, Maine, she doesn't know she's there. Um, so, um, so and, and that when that was beginning to happen, Doris was cognitively impaired, her blood pressure going crazy. There was some money left at Sunshine Lady Foundation, and we were trying to get to get some of it right, and. And we negotiated back and forth with Mitty Bill, and, and, and the negotiation ended because I was telling her we had pulled 34 applications where not just me, but everybody in the office, we were convinced if we didn't get involved with these 34 people's lives, they would return to prison or overdose and die or die from suicide. And we're experiencing this, and we, we, we're a good predictor of it. And, and, uh, um, and and so I was having a very candid discussion with Mitty, who at that point I'd known for five or six years, and I said, I'm like, this is life or death. And she had the audacity to write me an email and said it was Sunshine Lady Foundation policy to not, uh, to not invest in life or death situations. And you know, I was stunned. I haven't talked to her since because the, the, the thought that ran through my mind is it's always life or death. It's always life or death. With people leaving prison, mentally ill, rated by the DOC to be high risk to recidivate, it's always life or death. If you're S code three or four, S code two, three, four, mentally ill, come out to abject poverty, um, and, and you've got drugs and addiction in your life and co-occurring disorders, it's life or death. It is, and, 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 um, and for this woman who supposedly knew reentry, um, to, to, to have not recognized that was mind-boggling for me. And now it's like four years later and I'm still angry about her ignorance. Um, and, and, to, and as a matter of fact, Joe Jensen put a package together, took our last application to Norcliffe Foundation, and sent it to Mitty Beale in Philadelphia with a, a really good letter that I was copied on, and, and tried to drive home the point that, that Mitty, what she wrote in 2015, was utter stupidity. It was callous disregard for the people she says she cares about. Um, and as far as I know, Mitty didn't even answer Joe Jensen. And, and Joe wrote that letter because her nephew, Joey Jensen, died. He, at 11.30 one morning, he walked down here to the train station uh, and jumped. And, and at 4 o'clock the next morning, they took him off life support. Um, so it, it, it is always life or death. And, and, and for this person who has sat on the top of millions and millions of dollars, and still to this day she's sitting on about $30 million of Doris's money. There was a, a legal battle between Doris and Boston and, and the old foundation in Philadelphia, and, and there was a settling, and there was a lot of bad feelings, and Doris's grandson claiming that Mitty Beale, there's actually a, a newspaper article about it, that Mitty Beale and that board in Philadelphia had misuse Doris's money or whatever and so there was a big conflagration and and uh, uh, and, a, and a parting of the ways but for her to have to continue she's continuing to misuse Doris's money because the money in the coffers at Sunshine Lady Foundation is Doris's money so Doris maybe has 50 million in Boston and and left behind 30 million in Philadelphia and and so it's still being misspent and it's being controlled by this lady who is so goddamn ignorant about reentry that um, that she doesn't understand that it's always life or death. And the one caveat I would say to that is, to me, if you return to prison, that's a form of death. You know, period. So death is death. Return to prison is death, as far as I'm concerned. And especially if the return to prison is not necessary. I'm done. How can people find out more about your organization? Um, there's, I thought the interview with Cairo FM the other day was excellent and so really super current. 
Um, that's on our Facebook page, that's on my Facebook page, it's on Dave Ross's, the, got the podcast with a full transcript. The, we've got a separate set of circumstances which I discussed with you on KODX the other night and you've got that podcast up and they can, they can email me that for that or go to KODX 96.9, it's on your Facebook page, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, the, 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 the city of Seattle came to us quite a few years ago. Uh, they have a TV channel and they wanted to do a documentary. And that documentary won an Emmy. And I think, and I think it uh, does a fabulous job. So you can Google, it's kind of a long Google, Seattle channel community stories post-prison education program and you'll get this 13-15 minute documentary that won an Emmy as a news report. And that really show, that shows inside the office, us inside prisons. I, I, think, I think it deserved the Emmy that it got and it really tells the story. And then more recently, uh, Brave New Films, Robert Greenwald's documentary company, uh, that and that screened at Benaroya Hall last May, two Mays ago, which surprised me. That's a 17-minute documentary, and I think, and, and, it, and it features, both of those feature students, right? Um, and um, that, to Google that one, that's, or it would be Brave New Films, Addiction, post-prison education program. So like have Brave New Films name, our name, and addiction in there when you Google it and that'll take you to that documentary. And it's excellent. Uh, um, and uh, they can write to me at ra.cone at postprisonedu.org. Um, they can call here. Uh, the, the office number is 203, 206, 503, 2300. Uh, we've got 23 trunk lines coming in here. We get 900 calls a month from prisoners. So, uh, if if you might you might land in voicemail, but uh, we'll respond to voicemail. My extension is 1001. Um, there's a short documentary that River Sticks Foundation did of our first graduate. That's on. It's the home. So if you go to our website, which is junk, frankly, I mean we're we spend money on, we prioritize tuition, books, housing, rent, groceries, and we don't prioritize the website, and that's evident. But this documentary, I think it's called Becky Healing Dreams, uh, is like the home page of the website right now, and it's just seven minutes, and it's really good. And uh, so it's like, or you can come here. We're, it, it, we're at the a big intersection in Soto, 6th and Lander, uh, we're in a massive, somewhat massive argument with uh, the building owner due to massive HVAC issues, et cetera. And uh, so we've got one room here that the temperature is probably 103 degrees right now. We've got a room over there that's been so, so so hot we've had to put a portable air conditioner in it we've got a room immediately adjacent to it that's so cold you have to put a space heater in it and the building manager has refused to fix all that so we're litigating now the blue angels are flying over hold on a minute and uh and we just found out from an hvac contractor we had in to um, to find out what it would cost to fix the hvac problems that Everything he's seeing here, uh, he felt like it wasn't. What it's not up to code. So we last week we had city city of Seattle Department of Construction and Inspection people in here and confirmed that all, all the construction that's happened in this office since last October that wasn't permitted uh, uh, or most all of it the uh, and thus not inspected. And so we've got that mess going on. Um, 
and I talked about that on KODX the other night. So, um, but uh, come on down, uh, six and land or twenty four fifty Sixth Avenue South. Uh, this is a huge building, so don't try the entrance on Lander. You got to come to the twenty four fifty Sixth Avenue entrance. We're Suite two hundred. And we've got, you know, we've got, we've got all the University of Washington research and data. We've got, we can anecdote you to death. We've got printed materials. People are willing to sit down and, and read applications and, and go through student files. We'd love to have that happen. We had, that's another sad anecdote. We had this board, but we used to try to get, to get people to understand, this will be the end of my story. The, uh, Zuckerberg's 30,000 may be the end of my story because it could be the end of the program, which would be then I'll disappear into retirement. And that'll be that. But uh, uh, the uh, uh, we we used to try to get people in, to better understand who we've got locked up by reading their applications. So we would invite board members to come in and check out six or seven applications and take them home and score them. And we, we made sure we knew which ones were going out and we kept, we tracked it pretty closely. And over a couple month period, everybody quit. And I'll never forget Lori Guilfoyle, who used to work for United Way, just came in one day to say why she, she came in like 5.15 in the evening and um, and she was returning some applications, and she was trying to explain why she could keep doing it. She was crying. So uh, it's uh, maybe you should do a chapter two to this. I'm going to tell you another story that, that uh, and then you can you can you can cut this freely. But like. Um, A friend, a friend of mine, Blue Angels Are Killing Us, um, who uh, has written for Slade, New York Times, and published author, wrote a book called Hustle. His name's Doug Merlino, and uh, lives in New York now. And if you read Hustle, you can't not know, as a matter of fact and certainty, that the color of your skin and the zip code you were born in has everything to do with where you're going to be here. It's just a fact. I mean, there was a, a group of 10 or so kids that played basketball together at Lakeside. Some were black, some were white, some came from poverty, some came from wealth. And when Doug went back and looked at where they were at in, their, in his book, Hustle, um, one black guy was in prison, one black guy had, was living a good life as a coach uh, and teacher. Uh, others were dead. The white guys are like Superior Court judge, hedge fund manager, Doug Merlino, an author in New York. Um, but, um, and I just, uh, that carries over to who we've got locked up. And, and, and so, and it leads up to what I, you know, we, we, we as the people who put people in the legislature with our votes, we don't know who we've locked up. I know, because I'm in the prisons all the time. I'll be in prison this week. I was in prison two weeks ago in Walla Walla. I'll be in prison in Purdy this week. Um, and we've got prisoners that come into this office, actual prisoners we've, uh, and, and former prisoners. So we know, but the public doesn't know. And, and so I'll tell you a story. The, the, the River Sticks Foundation video that's on uh, Becky, that's on our website, uh, this is her story. She talks about it a little bit, but um, she's a law-abiding mom of three at the time, living in Walla Walla, working the job of her dreams, which was a nurse. And she was kidnapped, and she was locked in a house in Kennewick, and over a weekend she was repeatedly raped. So like every X number of minutes, she'd hear the footsteps coming down the hall, and she knew what was going to happen again. So she, she escaped that house and um, took a leave of absence from the, from the hospital due to trauma. 
And the trauma wasn't the physical trauma, it was the mental trauma. And she crashed into Gary Locke when he left being governor and went to work at Davis Wright Tremaine, wrote a beautiful 13-page documentary. I mean, uh, I forgot what it was called, but it was, it was uh, not a documentary, but a 13-page something he, they, lawyers at DWT interviewed Becky, and they came out with this 13-page document that I still have. Um, in the process of trying to get her license to practice back, but uh, uh, there's a scene in that where where he, where Becky is in, downstairs in her house, uh, like in a fetal position, lights out in the closet, just all crunched up. And, and and deep depression, right? And that and so she wasn't functioning as a mom, as a as a wife, as a as a nurse. She just was not functioning. She had too badly traumatized and and had just sunk into deep depression. So a, a friend of hers, who she worked with at the hospital, came by and introduced her to meth. And and uh, so she could be happy again, right? And. And, and then so later Becky tried to return, and she became addicted. And so she tried to return to work, but she's using at that point. And you can't function well as a registered nurse in a, 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 if you're on drugs. And so she lost her job. Then she didn't have the income to, to pay for the drugs that she was addicted to. And she, she began manufacturing, so she's manufacturing and dealing and using. <laughs> and she got arrested. And she uh, was sentenced to seven years in prison. And when that trial went on, when that happened, you didn't see one word in the Walla Walla Union bulletin about the kidnap, the rape, not one word about that. All you saw was Republican Ronald Reagan Democratic Hillary Clinton, Democrat Bill Clinton, Republican George Bush, Richard Nixon, that kind of language that you see in, in Brave New Films, Power of Fear movie, you know, that she was a, 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 a person who manufactured and dealt drugs and lost her freedom as she should and was locked and was being sentenced for seven years. And, and that, that was the right thing to do. Not one word about the background. And that's always the case with the goddamn media, including the fucking Seattle Times, which I hate. That, but that's always the case. You know what? You know you. I'm not going to talk about individuals you know, but you know you can be. Uh, <coughs> you can be a 12 year old girl in Everett, and your mom's a police officer, and you're abused so badly by this police officer that as a 12 year old girl you flee into homelessness. You know, and then you get involved with drugs and addiction, and that, and then, then you, your future is written. It's jails and prisons. That's Gina McConnell Lawton, who's in that documentary that won the Emmy. It, the background never comes out in the media, and it's a huge disservice. It's, you know, half truths are lies. That you know, so every time Blethyn, Blethyn, and Blethyn Incorporated tells a half truth or half the story or a third of the story, they're lying because it's the whole story that's needed. And, and so, uh, so Becky, uh, so, so, that, so that's it, you know. And, and you know, the, the other sad part was she got seven years, the guy who kidnapped and raped her, <coughs> one or two years. I forget whether it was one year or two, but got two years. And so, <coughs> uh, and the, and the la you know, the last part of that is, after this, they won't be friends anymore. But years ago, a reporter introduced me to Liz uh, Browning, Elizabeth Browning. And Liz is married to Chris Browning, who's a descendant of Browning Firearms. And in this town, maybe if you say you're, you know, they're wealthy as far as I'm concerned. They may not be Jeff Bezos wealthy. They may not be Bill and Melinda Gates wealthy. <coughs> But they're wealthy, if you and their son. And this is, was written about in a beautiful article by the Seattle PI, the kind of article you'll never see in, in Blethyn Blethyn Incorporated. 
uh, aka Seattle Times, but th they, their son suffers schizophrenia. And, um, but Mark's not in prison because her fam his family has wealth, right? It's just that simple. It's that simple. So if, you, if, you're, if you're mentally ill and, and addicted or just mentally ill and you're born into wealth, you're okay because your family can afford to have you get the care that everyone should have, right? If you're, if you're like Liz and Chris's son, Mark, and you, and you, and you suffer schizophrenia, you're not going to be in a place in Southern California and La Mesa in a community-based place uh, with, that's nice and with stupendous mental health care. Uh, you're going to be in the King County Jail with 2,000 other people. You're going to be out on the sidewalk in front of DESC's Morrison. Uh, and you're going to be in the Washington State Department of Corrections prison at Monroe, SOU, or in the bar units at Walla Walla, or in the unit for mentally ill out at Purdy. And, and it's all whether you're born into wealth or poverty because the government is goddamn sure proven that they're not going to take care of its people. Really, they're not. And, and that's, what, that's why 39 to 50 percent of Washington's prisoners suffer serious mental illness. And, that, and that's just so wrong, and I'm really done. So, like, send money, we can use it, and we use it wisely. And I don't care if it's $5 or $20,000, we'll take it. And right now, it might save the nonprofit because of what Zuckerberg's company's done. And in the absence of it, we might not be here to have this conversation. I'm really done. Edit away.